Good morning, everyone. We're still asleep. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. I feel better. Okay. So um, thank you all for coming. And I am delighted that B-Sides brought me in. Uh, what I will tell you is that I really don't want to be the only person talking here. So I'm going to be asking you folks some questions. Um, and feel free to ask me questions as we go, because frankly, uh, number one, I don't want to be the only one talking. And number two, I'm one of those people where I'm 10 minutes into a talk and then I go, crap, there's something I really want to ask. Okay, I can see you in the talk. And I forgot what the heck it was. So, you know, you're, you're welcome to come up to me after the talk. I'll be here all day. But if there's some burning question you have, don't feel like you have to wait till the very end. So with that, this is what we're going to cover. Um, I'll give a little intro about myself. Um, I'm going to give you some background and history about this particular talk, where it came from, where I got the idea. Then we're going to focus on some defender assumptions, because uh, I am somebody who works in defense myself. And one of the things that I've learned over time is that the way we tend to think about defending our networks is missing some key information. That key information has to do with the offensive security side of the house. So we're going to talk then about um, immersion in offensive security and how that can actually make your job better. And, and we'll wrap up. So here's a little bit about me. Uh, as she mentioned, I, I'm Kathy Ullman. Uh, Catherine is what my parents call me, but that is the formal me. So, uh, you know, I am, uh, I work at the University of Buffalo. I've been there over 23 years uh, in a variety of, of capacities, but um, with the security office since 2009. Uh, and the joke is I am uh, one of the OG because there were only three of us and two of them are already gone. So ever since then, it's been me and a variety of other people, depending on the time frame. Um, I volunteer with a bunch of conferences. I'm on staff with a bunch of conferences. I run B-Sides Rochester. So, um, you know, if you ever get out that way, uh, and, and we have Matt here from B-Sides Buffalo. I've got a, I've got a fellow Western New York rep. Um, I've also uh, done a bunch of other things like uh, speak, and I love sloths. I, I always have to have a sloth picture. That's just a requirement for my talks. So here's the background piece of this. When I say how did I get here, I don't mean physically here. That's a really boring story I got in the car and I drove. So we're going to talk about how did I get to this sort of concept. And essentially what happened was um, I've been working in the defense space at the university uh, for a number of years. And we started uh, an independent study class called NetDef. And NetDef was a class where students could come and learn about how to participate in CCDC. Who's familiar with CCDC? A bunch of you. For those of you who aren't, it's a collegiate cyber defense competition. There is also a collegiate pen testing competition, which I learned about, and I'm also on. Uh, I'm also a volunteer with as well. But when we started this class, a lot of these folks coming in had very little sense of, of defending at all. So we had people from industry, myself included, who were there to help guide the students. Some of the people who were in this space were folks in offensive security. So how many of you are in offensive security? I see one. Yeah, a couple of you. Um, and the rest of you, defense, basically? Yeah, OK. That's what I would expect given the talk, but we do get offensive security folks come, and, and then that's awesome. Um, so what I learned was that there was this thing called offensive security that I didn't know existed. I knew how to be a sysadmin. That's the role I came up through. I had done help desk and those kinds of things. And I knew about securing systems. As uh, a sysadmin, it was something that was important to me. And what I will tell you is I've been doing this so long that back in the old days, we didn't have host-based firewalls. That was not a thing. If you had a host-based firewall on your server, holy crap, like nobody did that. OK, but I did because I had always been sort of security focused and I had never heard of offensive security. So getting to know these people, I said to them, tell me more. 
tell me more about this space and what that's all about. And the, the person I was speaking with said to me, go to a B-Sides. And I said, what the heck's a B-Sides, right? Um, I'm sure many of you had a similar conversation along the way that got you here. And B-Sides was the beginning. And I went to B-Sides Rochester. That was my first HackerCon. And I loved it so much, of course, now I run it. So I, you know, full circle and all. But in going to B-Sides and then subsequently to a bunch of other cons, I started to learn more about offensive security practices. And what I realized was there really is this sort of whole other side of security. And it may not seem like that, but it really is. Offensive security practitioners think typically in a very different way from defense. And it has a lot to just do with the fact that in defense, we're often so concerned about running the thing, keeping the thing going, <laughs> supporting the mission of the thing. And offense is trying to do testing against all of that. So while they're looking at what you're doing, that's not really their focus. So I found, I put the, this matrix graphic up, and hopefully, how, how many of you know the matrix? I find the longer I do this, the fewer hands I see. Okay, good, a lot of you know. So for me, it was very much like the red pill, blue pill, in the sense that, you know, I, I took the red pill and there was this whole other world, right? I didn't know it existed. So ultimately, that led to me recognizing there was way more to this. And as I started to have conversations with my colleagues in defense, I discovered they didn't know about this either. And that's where this presentation originated. So when I talk about defense and offense, I'm going to give you a couple definitions just so that we're on the same page. Um, I'm not going to read them to you because, you know, I, I don't want to insult anybody's intelligence. Um, but this is what I mean by defense, OK? Um, pretty, pretty straightforward. And this is what I mean by offense. And I purposely am not using blue team, red team here. And the reason I'm not using blue team, red team here, how many different definitions in particular of red team do you think there are? I hear at least a few giggles, right? Um, lots of different entities. You get the words pen testing, red teaming, like different companies call these different things. Different people have different senses of what those things are supposed to mean. I'm going to stick with offensive security because it kind of umbrellas all of that stuff without having to call out one piece in particular because it, it, it's really under one side of the house. So that's why I'm doing this. So let's take a look at how defenders think about securing their systems, typically, right? So this is what you do. You're, you're doing a web server build. These are the basic things you do, right? You're going to install the OS, and you're going to install whatever web software you have, and you're going to patch it. You're going to configure your, your firewall. You're going to configure your web stuff. If you're really good, you're going to vuln scan the thing, and you're going to document the heck out of it, and then you're good until you know a vendor comes out with a patch, right? I mean, this is. A, a, am I wrong, folks? Is this not how we kind of think about doing security with a machine, like a basic build? Yeah, I'm seeing thumbs up. Right. Okay. There's nothing wrong with this in this sense, right? It's just that it's missing some stuff, and here's what it's missing. Offensive security goes, oh, you left port 80 and 443 open. Because of course you did. It's a web server. But from the offensive security point of view, they're going, hmm, what can I do with that? Can I, can I do something with that that's not intended? How can I get somewhere from that spot? For those of you in, in red team, am I wrong? Or, or offensive security, am I wrong? Is that not what you're kind of looking for? Yeah, exactly. OK, um, so you're looking for ways you can get in. Are these fields sanitized? Is there stuff out, you know, encoded properly? Um, you know, what interesting things can we do from this point? 
And in my opinion, the most important bullet that's up here is what is its relationship to other systems? When you as a defender set up a web server, do you ever think about that? I see one not good because honestly, most people don't. They put up a server and they think about it in terms of business objectives, but they don't think about it in terms of security. And every system you have has relationships with other systems and types of data and other things it interacts with. And those relationships are what offensive security and likewise attackers are looking for ultimately. So, you know, that's the problem. So this quote gets attributed to a couple of different people, but the person who said it originally was John Lambert. And what I would say about this quote is, it's not about the graphs specifically, it's about the relationships. Graphs are a means to illustrating relationships, okay? So relationships are key. How many of you recognize this tool? A few of you, good. More of you should be familiar with this tool. So this is Bloodhound. This is a, a free tool that a company called Spectre Ops created to show relationships. And what's really cool about this, caveat, you must get permission, you can run this too. If your organization will let you, again, it's free, you can run it, you can see these same relationships. And when you see these relationships, for example, it will show you how to get from whatever account you have access to, can be, you know, JoeQ user person to domain admin, or there's even a, an Azure version of this that'll take you to global admin in so many steps. Here are the ways I can get from here to there. It makes offensive security's job much easier because nice pretty picture, here's how I get from here to there, okay? So it's, it's, it's good to know about. So now let's talk a little bit about some, some defender assumptions in general. How many of you heard just break the chain, right? This idea of the cyber kill chain, if you can break the kill chain, you're good. Who's heard of the cyber kill chain? Yeah. How many of you have been told part of the goal of defense is to break that chain? A few of you, right? Here's the problem with this. It's not bad that you break the chain, but if I'm a determined attacker or offensive security professional, likewise, and you break the chain in one place, am I done? No. This is a problem defenders often fall into, is they think, oh, the chain's broken, I've stopped the attacker that was doing this, and I'm going on to look at something else. Odds are, if an attacker is trying to get into your network in a particular way and they don't succeed, they're gonna try something else. And so if you're not looking for something else at that point, you're probably missing something. All right. How many organizations here have some form of EDR AV? Oh my goodness, I should see every hand go up, right? We all have this stuff. And these tools are very useful. And the, the more recent ones, even more useful because they can show us all kinds of things. And believe it or not, if you haven't heard this, there are defenders who believe if they have these tools in place, they are safe. Which I would hope most of you know is categorically untrue. And the reason it's untrue is that both attackers and offensive of security know there are pl places where what they do is study how to get around these things. Like that is their full-time job. How do I get around EDR, AV, whatever? And they sell or trade with entities that want that knowledge. So it doesn't matter what product you have. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, Cobalt Strike or Cobalt, um, CrowdStrike or Defender or, 
they all have somebody who's researching how to get around them. And there's a number of ways, too. So it doesn't matter if you've got tamper protection on. The first thing a good attacker will typically try to do is just shut it off. How many of you are looking for your EDR to get shut off in some capacity? Good. Those of you who raised your hand, awesome. All of you who didn't raise your hand, mental note. You should be looking for that because attackers love just turning it off. But they don't just love turning it off. They love just bypassing it. There are lots and lots of ways to bypass it. Um, you can use uh, command and control callbacks. Those are ways to just get around it. Who knows what a lull bin is? A few of you. All right. Those of you who don't know what a lull bin is, it's a living off the land binary. Living off the land binaries are part of the operating system. They are files that are native to the operating system or the environment in question because they could be files for, if you're running like VMware, they could be things like VMware tools. They will use files that are already on the system to do things they weren't intended to do but have extra functionality. If you've never heard of low bins, it is worth it to spend a few minutes and Google it because there's a lot of information out there. One of the reasons why attackers and offensive security people get found on systems is they bring their own tools, right? If there's, I mean, if, if an offensive security person or an attacker drops a tool on your system it, and EDR or something is running, it might catch it, right? Trying to get a file or something on the system is way more work than using what's already there. So it's very convenient. And there's a talk later today that's going to be talking about using lull bins, and I'm looking forward to hearing this one in particular. So um, it, you know, it happens all the time. It's very common, and uh, it's something you should be aware of. There's also, like, you can abuse the heck out of Active Directory and Azure. Uh, if you have these, these things in your environment and you're not spending some time reading about the attacks that are done, you're missing out because it is so easy to abuse those things. And your AV and your, your e you know, none of those tools are going to see that. They're not going to have any clue that's a problem. All right. Who recognizes what a MITRE heat map is? few of you. Good. Okay. Now, what I will say about MITRE is that MITRE is, I'm not going to say MITRE is bad. There's nothing bad about MITRE. It is limited. Um, and the reason it is limited has to do with what it's showing you and what people understand about it. So what's important to know is that there are three pieces to what can happen with an attack. There's the tactic, which is your goal, right? The technique, which is how you achieve that goal, and the procedure, which is exactly what you do to carry out that goal. So for example, the tactic is steal credentials. The technique is dump LSAS memory, but the procedure is Using proc dump to do that versus using task manager versus using uh, comservices.dll. There's a bunch of different ways to do that. The problem is MITRE ATT&CK mostly focuses on the techniques. This isn't bad, it's just limited. Because if as an attacker I can do whatever it is I'm trying to do with various procedures, and you have something in place to detect a, a technique, but I use a different procedure that's not part of that detection, what happens? Am I going to detect anything? No. So these MITRE heat maps are problematic because what does green really mean? Traditionally, for those of you who are not familiar, the heat maps are meant to show you where you have detections, where you need detections, and maybe where you need to just further develop those detections. The problem is they only show you a small portion of the story. So be aware that it's, you know, it's, it's not a bad thing to have detections in place and to know that you have certain detections in place, but understand the limitations of what those detections actually detect. This is one of my favorites. 
So our tools work as designed. We buy tools, we all buy tools. And we say, we set them up, we follow best practices, and we say, awesome, we have this thing in place, but do you really know it's working the way it's supposed to? And in most cases, we don't. Security researchers love looking at this stuff. And in particular, uh, Will Dorman does an amazing, amazing amount of research on dangerous drivers. Um, I, like every few weeks, he comes out with a little something new that he's, he's looked up. And he determined that Microsoft claims there are a couple of ways that Microsoft Defender for Endpoint can block a dangerous driver. Uh, one is HVCI. Uh, which is this hypervisor protected code integrity feature, and the other is this attack service reduction. The problem is, up until recently, the block list itself that was supposed to prevent the, the drivers from even being able to load, guess what? Didn't actually work, despite Microsoft going, oh, we have all this protection, yay! No, it didn't work. And even though it's, it, it has been populated now, they don't really have a plan for keeping it up to date. And not only do they not really have a plan for keeping it up to date, attackers like to just find ways to get their drivers signed legitimately. And there's been research done on that recently too. So what these tools look for and the way they work, you can't 100% rely on. So just because you have this in place doesn't mean you're good to go. Similar problem, Who, who's running Defender for Endpoint? A few, I see, yeah, hey, it's okay, we, we run it too. It's, it's actually a pretty good product. However, there are things it's supposed to be able to detect that if you don't change registry settings for, it's not actually gonna be detected because it's not collecting the right telemetry. And there was a, a great talk by Olaf Hartung who, um, who gave this for Wireless Hack and Fest, who talks all about these undocumented features of Defender. This is another one I love. We have MFA. We are not fishable. How many people laugh at that statement? Yeah, pretty much, you know, most people, right? If you're not laughing, you should be, because MFA is absolutely a good thing to have in place. You should have it in place. It is absolutely still fishable. And there's a bunch of different ways that that can be done, right? Um, you know, who's heard of, uh, of push, 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 push? No, no one ever does that, right? And then basically you wind up with people just being tired of the push notifications and clicking yes. It happens all the time. But there are other configuration issues. If you have legacy protocols, even if you think you have MFA, you may not have MFA. Not only that, um, passcodes, so pretty much every MFA system allows you to generate a set of passcodes in case you can't get back in. But those passcodes are good forever. If an attacker gets a hold of those passcodes and you haven't changed them, they love that. And all that has to happen is they put those passcodes on a, you know, on a local machine somewhere and they save them off. Somebody has a piece of paper and drops it. I mean, there's a million different ways that can happen. But on top of these methods, there's also attacks that can be done. Um, AITM, attacker in the middle, trying to get away from you know, some of the language that uh, is not appropriate. Um, Pass the cookie, and of course, social engineering, right? That never happens where somebody gets an urgent call, you have to just let me in, right? So because of the fact that we're taking a lot of these things for granted, we need a different perspective. And so I brought back my friend, the sloth here, although the first, the first one was actually the sloth that uh, I have um, adopted at the Buffalo Zoo. This is just a, a, a cute sloth. But the idea is we need to turn some ideas on their heads. We need a totally different perspective because obviously what we're doing isn't working, right? I mean, some of it is, but we're missing sections of it. So to that end, what I propose is that defenders need to immerse themselves 
in offensive security. And that does not mean change jobs. It does not mean you need a new certification. It does not mean, oh my goodness, I have to spend a thousand hours outside of work doing all this extra stuff. It means you need to know it exists. You need to spend a little time getting to understand how these attacks play out. So for any of you who have never seen this before, and I know for OFSEC folks, this isn't like the be all end all, there are different variations on this and it's not necessarily linear. They will go from one step to another and sometimes back again. But for anybody who doesn't know what an offensive security uh, playbook essentially looks like, these are sort of your basic steps, right? They gotta try to get in, that's the first step. Um, but before that, they need to know what to attack. So figure out what they're gonna attack, how are they gonna get in, how are they gonna stay in. I mean, this is, these are the basics. This is what they're thinking about. These are the relationships they're trying to build. So where do you find those folks? Well, guess what, you're to B-sides. And while we may only have a couple of those folks in this room, I'm willing to bet there are a bunch of others who are in other rooms. So this is a great place as you get to know people, if you meet folks who work in the offensive security space, get to know them. They can be a very valuable resource. But there's other places that you can meet them, meet folks too. Other security conferences, if you have local security meetups, some maker spaces, um, you know, folks will get together and do that sort of thing. Um, there's something called DEF CON groups if you're not familiar. Um, some of them do online uh, and virtual. Uh, there's an organization called 2600 that has meetups typically. There's online security communities and you know, even traditional security communities. There are offensive security people who will go to things like ISACA and ISSA events, um, you know, uh, conferences that are corporate driven. Um, but you, you need to seek them out. And then if you can, find some formal training, right? There are conferences, there are B-sides. The one I run has training, usually inexpensive training the day before. Security companies offer training. Anti-siphon, I can't say enough good stuff about. They have pay what you want training for certain things. So if you have no money or your co company won't budget you anything, you can sign up for, they, they have a whole series of classes that are free. If you want, if you need them to be free, they'll be free. If you, if you can afford to pay 25 bucks, they'll take 25 bucks. And even if at their full rate, they're way less than something, you know, like SANS, which I mentioned, but whatever. Um, there are online options. There are things called hack the box, try hack me. There are CTFs, there's one running right here. And YouTube has some great stuff. And higher education sometimes has classes you just have to look and see. So what about understanding more about how these folks think and what they do for their craft? Well, that's what we call tradecraft intel. So places you can find like how these things work uh, for an offsec person, go to places like Project Zero or Attacker KB. There's a zillion more of these, but realistically, they're researchers who work in this space and they do write-ups of here's an attack and here's how it happened and here's what the attacker did. Offensive security people spend time in that space learning about those attacks so they can use them too. But you can read about them as well and what I would recommend is if you don't have a whole lot of time to you know, take classes or do other stuff, this is a great way to just sit down and learn how an attacker moved through one particular attack. And even if you read one of these maybe a week, you'd start to see some patterns because a lot of this stuff is the same stuff over and over and over again. In the same way that defenders see the kinds of things that we see in terms of keeping the attacker out, attackers do the same things because they're successful with them. Um, Twitter, and I, and I know Twitter's a mess and, and everybody knows Twitter's a mess, but there's still a huge contingent of offsec folks and people who share 
ideas and tradecraft intel, uh, and of course Mastodon now, and probably Blue Sky and every other social media, but, but that's the idea. Organizational intel, on the other hand, can tell you a little bit more about your own organization. And what I can tell you is, offensive security people love organizational intel. They love organizational intel because the more they know about your org, the more they can figure out how to move within it, whether it's through social engineering or how things might be structured. Um, so make a point of understanding what's out there about your organization that could teach other folks about you and either work with your org to maybe remove some of it or at least put mitigations in place. Think about how that information could be used in a bad way of some kind. Um, other places, you know, as you can see, Pastebin, GitHub, et cetera, uh, internal wikis, I've been pwned is a great site. So I am not gonna talk about each one of these tools because I don't wanna you know, stand up here and talk about tools for half an hour or more. But if you are not familiar with this list of tools, if there's something on here you don't know, you should. So I would encourage you to take a picture of this particular slide and if there's anything you've never heard of, you should learn about it. These are some of the most common tools that offensive security professionals and likewise attackers like to use for their jobs. And I'll tell you right now, um, who here has heard of Mimi Cats? Good. There are people who do defense who don't know what Mimi Cats is, and when they see a reference in their EDR, their AV software that says something about Mimi Cats, they either ignore it, yes, they just ignore it because they don't know, or they say, oh, it blocked Mimi Cats, we're good. The problem, of course, what did we say earlier? Just one way in doesn't mean they're done. So seeing something like Mimikatz should be a big red flag to say, uh, Houston, we may have a bigger problem. But a lot of folks don't realize it. Okay, so in summary, because I want to make sure there's time for questions, defense is only half the story. If you're not learning about offense, going to talks about offense, even if you don't entirely understand what they're talking about, you're missing so much. And I used to come to conferences and only go to defense stuff because I was like, this is what I do, I'm a defender. I wanna just understand how to defend against attackers. But it never occurred to me, maybe I should be learning what the attackers do too, so I could you know, ultimately be a better defender. So, you know, that's really important. Be careful assuming that your tools work and that things function as you expect them to, where you can test them. There are ways to do that. Jump into that other half of the story and get to know people in the offensive security side. I have found most of the people in that side of the world love talking about what they do absolutely love it and they get excited and they want to share. You ask questions, odds are pretty good, they will laugh and they will happily share what they know. That has been um, an overwhelming experience for me in, in just in general. And you know, the more you can learn about what they do, the, the better. And ultimately, you'll become a better defender from that. I have to put this in, quick book shill. Uh, this is my book, The Active Defender. If you like this sort of concept of thinking about things from an offensive perspective, but we're talking about defending, uh, this book comes out in four days. The ebook is already available um, and it's, you know, most major retailer places. And uh, I always like to, to end on this slide. Um, I started out doing support, like a lot of folks did, and before that, I had a degree in music industry. This was definitely not where I thought I would wind up, but ultimately I think it was exactly where I was destined to be. And with that, I thank you. And I'll, I'll take questions, because we, we still have some time now. We've got about 10 minutes.
Sir, did I see, no, any questions at all? Okay, well, thank you again.